I'm a little bat. Yes, a good girl. This beautiful bat is a nocturnal, intelligent, clever, flies fast, can fly high, the height of three oak trees. She was found in London, in Knightsbridge, and somebody found her on a pavement. She was a young bat, and I think she hit a London bus. She was slightly damaged and very insecure, and it took a long time to mend the tears in her wings and the wounds on her back. She's a wonderful education bat. She goes round schools and meets children and helps people in the bat world understand what a nocturne looks like. You'll notice the short coat. The ears are rounded. All the fingers are folded back when they're not flying. The little thumb with a curved nail on the end is used for climbing. Each little toe is of the same length, so it's easy for them to hang up. The membrane goes round over the fingers, round the body and over the tail. The tail's very important because it helps them to steer and twist and turn and zoom. Bats rest in the daytime to save energy. The temperature lowers, the breathing slows down, the heartbeat slows down, their bodies get quite cold. They have to raise the body temperature by shivering and pumping their heart. And when they're ready and hot enough, like revving up a car engine, they automatically begin to use their sonar. Handling bats is not rocket science. You just have to be calm, relaxed and very gentle. And then they feel quite safe. A bat straight from the wild is just like this. You have to say with your body language that my hand is a home for you to snuggle into. It's not a prison. By being calm and relaxed, they will immediately feel safe. And they're very happy and they love to be stroked and cuddled. There are people like me who rescue bats in trouble, make them better and get them back to the wild. Every county has a bat hospital. Any bat in the open in the daytime is in trouble. They'll scoop him up in a handkerchief, take him home, put him in a box and then contact a bat person. Hey, my Millie. Good girl. I call her Millie because she came from Millets. And here she is. That's a good girl. And I wrap them, makes them feel really comfortable. And this is a whiskered bat. They're still flying with old plates on up to two or three years and doing daft things. And it doesn't take much for them to lose their confidence. So Millie is feeling a little bit insecure and a little bit worried, a bit underweight. So my job is having checked her over she's fine is to get her to relax and feed put on weight then i'll test fly her and see if she can go back home they can't drink until you've warmed them up but in the nice warm tissue and i'm gently going to open out the wing to see how it is oh, that's a good girl check all's well and there's the wing she's quite happy me resting it on the tissue that's the elbow forearm wrist Little claw is the thumb, and those are the fingers. That's it. And all looks well. And I'm going to check the shoulder, make sure it wasn't damaged, being caught under the door. So I'm going to release it. Oh, that pings back beautifully. Nothing wrong with that. You see how the membrane is attached to the little foot? It goes round the body and over the tail. That's how they steer. See how the shoulder is? That's perfect. She's putting the toes on my finger, both working fine. Now let's have a look at the tail, because the bat can't fly if the tail is damaged. Gently unroll the tail. Yes, that's fine, no problem there. The sonar they use automatically when they're wide awake, which is, plays a very important role at night to help them find their way around and detect the insects and their social voice when they're chatting to each other. So when your ears can hear it, as Millie was talking to me, chatter, 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 that's the social communication. I'm very gently going to feel down the back, little half circles. I'm checking and feeling for any hematomas. 
to check that the collarbone's all right. If it's broken, it would stick into my finger. I need to feel over the ribs to see if any of the ribs were broken in her accident under the door. It should be absolutely equal both sides. And down par over the pelvic area. I know the lower spine's all right, because otherwise her leg would be paralysed. All's well. Check the eyes are all right. Stroke between the ears to look at her little pearly whites. Yes, the teeth are in good condition. Good girl, that's it. Matting could be dried blood, or it could be glue, or cat saliva, or dried mud. Bats don't like going upside down, so I have to be very gentle with her and make sure that we have no matting on the fur, on the tummy. There. Millie has no injuries. She's definitely underweight. So she has to stay with me. I have to take a mealworm and I have to bed it. Look away if you're squeamish. And then I have to squeeze the juices. Think of it as an ice cream. Sometimes when they're dehydrated, they run out of saliva. So I have to offer them a drink as well. Would you like a little bit of moisture on that? Oh yes, that makes it go down much easier. She's got to put on quite a few more grams yet. I like to feel the spongy fat down her back. In the wild, the bats are feeding up manically because they're preparing for winter. And each of our 17 breeding species likes to choose a slightly different hibernaculum, dark, secret, quiet. It's a very good idea to go underground and some species do. In here I've got some juvenile pipistrel bats who I hand reared this year. Some came to me having been abandoned by their mother. And these are juveniles. I had to continue feeding with milk and mealworms they're fully grown. They don't fly well enough. They're too frightened to fly. They haven't learned all the skills from mummy. These ones are Pipistrellus pipistrellus, known as the common pipistrel. They have black faces. We've got the largest personality of all the bats. We're brave, we're gutsy, we've got a sense of humour and we love flying. And they'll eat about 3,000 midges, mosquitoes and small flies in a night. So these little chaps are your friends. You want them whizzing around your garden. And here we have two brown long ears. These ones are moth specialists. Now moths are clever. They can hear a bat coming. And some species close their wings, drop to the ground and scuttle away. Some moths have learnt how to echolocate themselves to detect a bat coming. And some moths have learnt how to make a horrible noise to jam the echolocation and confuse the bats. So a long time ago, these beautiful little bats came up with two cunning plans. One was to whisper the echolocation through that delicate little pink upturned nose so Mr Moth couldn't hear them coming. But in order to hear the soft whispering echo as it bounced back, they've had to grow gigantic ears. And if I gently wake him up, he'll show you his beautiful ears. There. When they're flying, the long ears lift up, rotate and are flung forward. They catch the sound and guide it onto the little ear at the base called the tragus. And the brain of the bat will translate the sound so they understand what's happening all around. There's a row of little hairs along the edge of the big ear, which picks up the vibrations of the insect as it's moving around. They've grown large, dark eyes. They can see in the dark. So when they've detected the moth, they flutter and hover near it, then switch the sound off and look and listen. Hover over the moth and with those gigantic gigantic feet and long curved toenails, they'll grab the moth and take it to their favourite feeding perch. They can live up to 40 years. Bats generally are divided into the two groups, gleaners and hawkers. 
Now the hawking bats are very fast. Streamlined bodies, long narrow wings, coming out at twilight. Then you have the gleaner group of bats. They hunt by stealth, secretly, quietly. Their wings are round. Their fur is fluffy, not short and dense. And they hunt secretly. They have larger ears because generally they talk softer. They've evolved to roost in trees and to forage in woodlands. Oak trees are some of the best trees you can possibly have for producing a great variety of different insects and bats love them. Beech trees are a great favourite too. The hawking bats, they need to drop six foot where they come out and be clear of foliage for fast exit and entry. Whereas the very shy bats like the brown long-eared and the rare barber straw and the beckstein, they flutter and hover under the vegetation, under the canopy, hidden secretly. All our species have different requirements. They need homes. And the odd dead bit on a tree will produce a wonderful breeding ground for the different insects which emerge, which the bats can feed on. Having a pile of old dead logs is a brilliant breeding ground and a wonderful little habitat for insects. What I have learned over all these years is that if you listen very carefully to the bat and watch the body language, it will tell you loud and clear what's wrong with it. And that's what I try and do. These are the beautiful brown long-eared bats. They are so amazing, these bats. These are gleaner bats. They're master gleaner bats. And these ones specialize in living on moths. They love moths. But moths are clever and have learned how to interfere with the echolocation sound of bats. So they can block it. And they can also take evasive action and dive out the way. Now these little guys have been living a very long time and they've devised, come up with these two cunning plans. And with their wide, broad wings and their wide tail membrane, they hover and flutter over the flowers, over the water, looking for Mr. Moth. And when they've located him, and also the little row of hairs along the edge of the ear will pick up the vibrations of the moth. So having located it, they hover over the moth, getting lower and lower. And then with those enormous feet, big feet, long toenails, curved toenails, they'll grab the moth and fly with it to their favorite feeding perch. They're woodland bats. They like normally to live in nooks and crannies and trees, but will always use your attic or loft as a, as a maternity roost because it's safe and it's all big yawn and warm. When they fly, it always amuses me. When you see them close up, their ears are flung forward like that because these, that one is, they're echolocating. The one with the ears up has warmed its body up and is curious. If I had my bat detector on, you'd hear what she was saying. She's echolocating now through her nostrils, but you can't hear it. The other one's a bit sleepy and can't be bothered because you know, these bats live over 40 years. It's purely incredible. Look at that interaction between the two. They're so sweet together. All these guys are the education team. They failed the flying exam. When I fly them in the sitting room to get them fit prior to release, I'm looking for three things. I'm looking for skills, I'm looking for stamina, and I'm looking for attitude. Each species will needs different skills and I need to see them and they need to fly for anything between 10, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour to show me that they're fit but they've also got to have the right attitude. They've got to say, whoops, how can I get out of here? I should close the wind in tight. Is the door shut tight? Not, oh dear, where can I hide? Won't do. Serotine and noctual and this is an interesting bat, that's Lysler. 
And then we have the slightly rarer bat. There's an Athusias there and a long-eared there and Natura. And then in the other cages, I've got uh, Whiskered, Brants, Long-eared and the three and the two other Pipistrels. Well done. There's a good girl. That's all right, Sophie. Mummy's here. Good girl. The serotine, it's one of our, oh, it's big yawn, oh, that's lovely, well done, one of our largest. It's knocking, it's not rare, it's knocking on the unusual list. It's found in the southeast of England, spreading southwest. They're more of a glean about, they're quite interesting, their lifestyle. She's opening and closing her mouth because she's echolocating. Now she's, once the bat has warmed up, and raise the body level to over 32 degrees, they automatically begin to echolocate. Now she says, oh, I can't be bothered. I've gone back to sleep now. At least the eyes are open. Oh, but yeah, we'll have a little shout. They do it automatically. Oven gloves are brilliant, but all bats need to hang or lie. That's a tea cosy. They love the tea cosy oven gloves. So you give them the choice. Do they want to hang or do they want to go in and lie? Aprons are brilliant because they've got pockets as well and tea towels. On the floor, I line it with tea towels and then put this on because it's easier to clean and keep whipping these off and replacing them. And the whole secret about keeping bats happy long term is to make sure they've always got food available so they relax about the food. When I do talks and I go to shows and I show my bats, People say, I never thought they were like that. They've got furry coats and they've got cute little faces. Um, tell me more about them. You can't show a bat to the public who looks manky, unhappy and unhealthy. So I'm constantly striving to keep my bats as healthy and as happy as I possibly can because then the public say, aren't they gorgeous? I want to learn about them. How can I look after them? How can I protect them? How can I encourage them? People don't realise what Mr Cat does when he goes out at night through a cat flap. He is fascinated by the echolocation. It absolutely mesmerise. They catch them where they emerge, drink or feed. Even a three-legged cat with one eye can do it. It's not difficult. Simple solution. Mr Cat must stay in the house all night, starting one hour before dark. It's no good getting him in when it's dark because it's over dusk and different species come in, come out at different times during dusk. One hour before dark, Mr. Cat comes in. Any bat in the open in the daytime is in trouble. All healthy bats should be hidden away, tucked away safely in their roosts. If you come across a bat in the daytime in trouble, don't just walk by. Scoop it up, take it home and put it in a box. And I'm going to show you with this bat here how to do it. So if you see a bat on the ground or on a wall, take out of your pocket a handkerchief. Cover the bat with a handkerchief. Pick him up gently and take him into the house and if you have an empty shoebox ask somebody to prepare it line it with kitchen paper with a soft cloth find a milk bottle top or a water bottle top stick it in the corner and gently place the bat in the box it will smell the water crawl over and have a drink. Never pick up the bat in your bare hands. It will be very frightened and you could damage it. A few holes in the lid, like this. And then put the bat at room temperature safely. Then go and ring the Bat Conservation Trust headquarters in London. The girls at the desk will ask where you're ringing from and they will be able to give you the telephone number of the nearest bat worker. You phone them and they will come and rescue the bat. And they'll be able to tell you what species it is and will be able to look, perhaps you have a roost around your home, and give you all the vice you want to know.
they can also give you these tremendous leaflets which will give you lots of information encouraging bats so you can help the bats who live around your garden gardening for bats by growing a great variety of plants and flowers which draw the different insects in which the different bats will feed on have a small pond which is the breeding ground for the small insects and somewhere for the bats to drink hang up some bat boxes and they can give you leaflets on how to make these and tell you how and where they should be put. And then it's no good inviting the bats to visit your garden and live there if your cat is going to kill them all. Cats don't eat bats but they're fascinated by the sound they make and they catch them where they emerge at dusk by climbing onto a flat roof or the cat sitting at the edge of the pond as the bat flies low to take a mouthful of water, the cat will toss it with his paw. Or the cat will sit on the herb garden or under the honeysuckle, as the bat follows the same feeding route every night. Every night the cat is there to play with them. They don't eat them. The bat may fly away, but if a tooth and a claw has penetrated the body, it will die from septicemia ten days later simple solution to all these problems. Mr Cat stays in the house all night, starting one hour before the light begins to dim. And then you can sit back on your patio with a gin and tonic and enjoy the bats flying around your garden. Your family can become interested and as they return each year you can rejoice and count them, look after them and welcome them because bats, they need our help. And they're such great little guys.